أولاً I would like to thank the organized committee for this elegant program and this elegant city and uh, it is my pleasure to be share this uh, uh, session with my colleague Ahmed Fathi, Hussam Bishr, Kamal Mahmoud, Magdi Matar, Muna Abu Saud, Omar Al Bahai, uh, Saif Kamal, and uh, me. Uh, I, I would like to invite one uh, of uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, United Emirates, Dr. Uh, Firas uh, Badr, who will speak about the introduction uh, intolerance to disease modified therapy. We know that despite the advancement and the management of cardiovascular disease, but still the prevalence of heart failure is still present. Dr. Firas will study the intolerance to the disease and the modified therapy. Dr. Firas, father. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee as well as the scientific committee for inviting me to this meeting yet for another time. Uh, this has been a, a dear meeting to my heart and I understand it's the first time it happens outside of Cairo. So I'm pleased to be part of that transition as well. Special thanks to my dear friend and colleague, Professor Magdi Abdul Hamid for uh, this great opportunity. In the next uh, 12 minutes or so, I will be discussing with you the uh, concept of intolerance to guideline uh, directed medical therapy. And I added to my title the idea of fact versus fiction. Because as you'll see throughout my presentation, a lot of what we call intolerance to guideline directed medical therapy may in fact not be intolerance to guideline directed medical therapy. So with that, let me proceed by reminding you that this is the clinical course of heart failure. It's a progressive course with chronic decline. These patients usually have episodes of acute decompensated heart failure, and with that, their morbidity and mortality continues to increase. They could be also suffering from sudden death, and with that, their course could be uh, shortened significantly because of uh, these episodes as opposed to having the expected uh, outcomes with uh, better therapies. As we're starting this fantastic meeting, I think it's worth reminding you of this new landscape of heart failure therapy that starts with these four pillars of medical management in uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, now defined as anything below uh, 50%. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system blockade, specifically ARNI as the prototype at this point for this new class of medications, uh, beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, and of course, reassessing down the road. But if you look at the bottom of this guideline slide, it talks about continuation of guideline directed medical therapy with serial reassessment and optimization of dosing adherence, and patient education while addressing goals of care. So the emphasis on guideline-directed medical therapy starts at the beginning of heart failure management and continues all the way to the end, including when you're preparing patients for advanced therapies like heart transplant or left ventricular assist devices. And let me remind you again, as we start this wonderful meeting with emphasis on guideline-directed medical therapy, that these are the numbers needed to treat to save one life of um, heart failure patients. This is all-cause mortality. If you look at the far right of this table, uh, numbers are ranging from six all the way to 28. These are the numbers of patients you treat to save one life with a medication. We're not talking about devices. We're not talking about major surgeries. We're not talking about transplant. We're talking about medications. So. Treating people with appropriate therapy really ends up saving lives at a significantly lower cost than the more advanced options. And the guidelines clearly say, as a class one indication with a class of recommendation of A, uh, in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, titration of guideline-directed medication dosing to achieve target doses showed to be efficacious in randomized controlled trials is recommended to reduce cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations unless not well tolerated. 
and it also recommends as a class 2A with level of evidence C that in patients with heart failure and reduced uh, ejection fraction titration and optimization of guideline directed medication as frequently as every one to two weeks depending on the patient's symptoms by uh, vital signs laboratory findings can be useful to optimize management this is the concept of individualization that I will highlight throughout my presentation as well now true intolerance to guideline directed medical therapy is really bad news okay if you look at these clinical factors uh, systolic blood pressure below 90 millimeters of mercury, creatinine of more than 160, hemoglobin of less than 12, no treatment with renin angiotensin and aldosterone system blockade, no treatment with beta blockers. The more you have of these factors, the worse the prognosis. So if you look at the red color here, when you have three to five of these risk factors, the one-year survival is less than 50%. So not, not being able on these medications because of true intolerance is really bad news because it means that the patient is now sick enough to where you really cannot continue with these medications. So before we prove intolerance, we have to try our best to achieve tolerance of these medications. What's happening in the real world? This is the CHAMP registry. This is from the United States, from primary care and cardiology practices, so an outpatient study. Prospective observation are randomized with an EF of less than 40% and more than one heart failure medication. What do we see here? If you look at the red color, these are the patients who are without contraindication, but they're not treated with the medication. So if you look at the third column from uh, the right or the left in this case, ACEs, ARBs, or ARNI, about one quarter of patients do not have any contraindication, but they're not on the medication. Almost one third um, who qualify for beta blockers are not on beta blockers. And of course, for mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, almost two thirds in this sample were not on the medication. This is more alarming. If you look at the red color here for these different classes, it's patients who are less than 50% of the target dose of these medications. And only patients who uh, are in the blue segment here are actually patients who are at target, obviously highest with the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. So while many patients are not on this class, when they are on this class, they achieve target dose because the target dose is easy. You just put them on 25 uh, milligrams of uh, spironolactone or eplerinone. This is a new paper. It was published literally today in Jack Heart Failure. This is a large registry called the Evolution Heart Failure Registry. More than 270,000 patients from Sweden, Japan, and the United States. And it shows that the utilization of medications like uh, dapagliflozin or um, sacubitor valsartan as the new novel therapies compared to older classes of medications is significantly lower here as you look at the uh, first two columns with the blue and red compared to the other three columns. If you look at the far right, the red color here represents discontinuation at one year after hospitalization. So very alarming to see that we have this high percentages of patients discontinued from therapy a year after hospitalization. So rather than actually be on a higher percentage of medications, or have higher percentage of patients on medications, we have lower percentage. This is from the get with the um, guideline registry, more than 16,000 patients. And I showed you now what's happening in the real world as far as outpatients or what happens after hospitalizations. But what's the outcomes of these patients once these medications are discontinued? Here you can see to the left the one year mortality when patients are not started or discontinued of renin angiotensin aldosterone system blockade or beta blockers, as opposed to the green and blue lines that show started or continued on therapy. So clearly very different uh, outcomes when it comes to uh, mortality and to the right mortality or readmission for heart failure. So the fact that we don't have patients on guideline directed medical therapy as an outpatient or after discharge from the hospital is bad news, but it's also clearly associated with poor outcomes. So why are patients not on maximum tolerated doses of guideline-directed medical therapy? False perception of stability. False perception of adverse effects, like the blood pressure being an issue. 
renal function being an issue, electrolyte changes, transition of care, post-discharge. These are the main reasons, the three main categories for why patients are not on proper guideline directed medical therapy. We've learned a few lessons from the paradigm study. If in paradigm study, people were randomized uh, based on tertiles of hospitalization. So not hospitalized, hospitalized within three months, hospitalized within three to six months, six to 12 months, or more than 12 months. And if you look at the most stable patients without prior heart failure hospitalizations, 20% experienced the primary endpoint. 17 of them died during the study, 30% of these because of sudden death. If you look at the least stable patients, those who were hospitalized within three months, 29% experienced the primary endpoint and 19 died during the trial. So the most stable patients, by definition, 17% died during the trial. The least stable, 19% died during the trial. You can see there is similarity in outcomes. So there's no tr true stability in heart failure patients. So what is a stable heart failure patient? It's a patient that has very low mortality, very low morbidity, and good quality of life. So how do we define unstable? heart failure then. Well, patient who dies is clearly unstable. Patient who is hospitalized is unstable. Patient who comes to the ED frequently is unstable. The patient who has frequent outpatient visits is an unstable patient. Frequent outpatient adjustments of medications also reflects instability. The patient who you feel bad about, that you have this uncomfortable feeling about may be unstable. And the patient who feels poorly, like the patient who's having bad quality of life is also unstable. So any of these things define instability. Therefore, stability is assessed with multiple factors, including clinical, hemodynamic, functional, structural, as well as biologic. So don't look at the stable patient from just one angle. It's multiple, multiple angles to decide that this patient is stable. Now, we learned that medications, based on all of the data I've shown you, are underutilized. Medications are underdosed, especially with older patients, low blood pressure, and renal insufficiency. Medications are ignored after hospitalizations, which leads to more hospitalizations and worse outcomes. This is what happens if we're focusing now on the blood pressure issue. In the paradigm study, if you look from the left to the right, you'll see that patients who were enrolled with the lowest blood pressure actually ended up with the best improvement um, of blood pressure. And those who were enrolled with the highest blood pressure ended up with the drop in blood pressure. So it's, it's, it's physiologic. When you improve the cardiac output of a patient because of improving hemodynamics and improving neurohormonal blockade, the uh, blood pressure will actually get better. So don't worry about the blood pressure being on the lower side when you're starting therapies. This is for mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. Again, cardiovascular death or hospitalizations. Hospitalizations for heart failure, cardiovascular death, or all-cause death. If you start with a lower blood pressure, you actually end up doing better because you improve this patient. There is room for improvement, and with the improvement in cardiac output, the blood pressure improves as well. What about renal insufficiency? You've seen this from the paradigm study. The slope of the decline in GFR is better when you put patients on sacubitril valsartan compared to enalapril. You've seen this from the emperor reduced. There is a slight dip in the GFR at the beginning, but then that slope is reduced as well. So don't fear the slight worsening in renal function at the beginning because on the long run, these patients will actually end up with better uh, renal outcomes. And then remember hospitalizations. Why do people stop uh, medications after hospitalizations? Acute renal injury, hypotension, hyperkalemia, but in fact, most patients who ended up stopped of renal angiotensin aldosterone system blockade during hospitalization, it wasn't because the renal function worsened. It was because of the fear that the renal function will worsen. So there's a lot of what we do that is based on how we expect patients to behave, how we expect the blood pressure to behave, how we expect the kidney function or electrolytes to behave, but not really because they're intolerant to therapy. This is what happens with hyperkalemia. Significant proportion of patients end up with discontinuation of their therapies or down titration at least. And if the hyperkalemia is severe, more of these patients are discontinued. Now we have agents to treat hyperkalemia that will allow us 
to keep these medications at the current doses or continue to up titrate them. And remember that morbidity and mortality in different uh, categories of patients with CK CKD, heart failure, diabetes, or the entire population in this study will end up being worse as medications are down titrated or are discontinued. So strategies to increase chances of achieving target doses of guideline-directed medical therapy start at a low dose, titrate at specific intervals so the patients can expect it. Titrate to higher doses only if the adverse effects at the lower doses disappear, and then individualize, individualize, individualize. And what do I mean by that? Here is the approach that I use. The goal is to have patients on the target doses of life-saving therapies as efficiently as possible. So you start with a basic combination of evidence-based therapies. I prefer to start with RNA and beta blockers because they're neurohormonal blockades. But you can choose to start with beta blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors, for example. Titrate to target doses and add other classes at the same time. Individualize. Look at your clinic setup. Is this patient going to come back soon or not come back soon? Is the patient going to pay for these medications or not? Is the patient going to be compliant with these medications? What's the renal function? What's the serum potassium? You can't just assume that one size will fit everybody and you just throw all of these medications at patients on the first day. You have to individualize. And then reevaluate based on symptoms, blood pressure, heart rate, urgent visits, hospitalizations, and consider escalating to other medications. I call this the STAIR protocol. Start, titrate, and add, individualize, and reevaluate. So in summary, heart failure is associated with significant mortality, morbidity, and poor quality of life. All can get better with proper utilization of guideline-directed medical therapy. Real-world evidence suggests poor utilization of guideline-directed medical therapy and poor outcomes related to that. Stability in heart failure is relative. There's no absolutely stable heart failure patient. Clinical reasons to compromise aggressive titration of medications like low blood pressure, low GFR, or high potassium are usually negotiable and can be overcome. Individualization is key in successful implementation of guideline-directed medical therapy in most patients. This is an open invitation for you to come to our heart failure conference in January. Uh, it will be January 27th, 29th in Dubai. We welcome you all, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faraz. One question, if you please. In our community, in Arab community, what do you think is the main cause of interruption of treatment? Is it due to a lack of knowledge or uh, the cost? Or what, what the cause? Because the uh, curve of uh, the deaths after heart failure increasing despite the improvement in the mode of therapy for all the causes of this heart failure. I think in, it's multifactorial. Um, in our region, resources represent a significant reason. Okay? So cost, compliance, clinic setups. Uh, we don't have as many heart failure clinics as we should. A lot of these patients are not following as frequently as they should. I think the, the, the balance between the physician and patient-related factors here is, is a lot more than in developed countries where if, you, if they have uh, discontinuation or lack of titration at their end, the overall percentages are going to be less than in our region, no doubt. They are, if you look at the registry I showed from Sweden, Japan, and the, and the U.S., there were other also uh, registries. Clearly, the more developed countries have higher percentages of guideline-directed medical therapy as opposed to us here. But I think the physician factors there as far as contribution to why are more than us here. I think this, the, the patient factor here is also very important. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ferraz, thank you for your uh, elegant presentation. Uh, this lecture is about intolerance of uh, uh, drug-modifying agents uh, in heart failure, especially the four pillars that I talked pillar is the ACE inhibitors and ARNI. هنا الانتوليرانس حيكون ان ذا فورم اوف وات ان ذا فورم اوف وات يعني اي 
commonly it's because of the blood pressure, kidney function, or potassium, like I said. But many of, many of, many of the instances that we label patients as intolerant, like I showed you when these are discontinued during hospitalization, they're actually not true reasons. And the blood pressure being borderline is not a reason not to put patients on these medications as long as they're asymptomatic, because the likelihood is that the blood pressure will actually improve over time. Most of the time, people are stopping these medications because of the worry about kidney. It's not a true uh, a concern because the kidney function declines at the beginning, but then improves long term. Uh, and, and many times, it's just the fear that the kidney function will worsen. And of course, the potassium, the potassium may be legitimate, but many of the times, the potassium, the, the potassium level is actually not in the serious level. It's just in the mild elevation to where you can just continue the medication. What about the other drugs, like uh, hydralazine, uh, isobutylbutyrate? If you uh, uh, this drug can be used when there is intolerance. Agreed. For the first four pillars. First of all, um, if you look at outcomes, the reason uh, ACEs, ARPs, and now Entresto replaced hydralazine and nitrates is that they achieved better outcomes than mean medications when they were compared head to head. So we shifted to that because of the outcomes, number one. Number two, there's nothing wrong with going to these medications, but only after you're certain that the patients really cannot be on these medications. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Firas, uh, for your elegant uh, lecture. Uh, now I'm going to announce uh, for the second lecture, uh, which will be given by Professor Walid Al Awadi from Cairo. Uh, he's going uh, to say uh, our uh, a few next uh, minutes uh, about uh, worsening uh, of heart failure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Magdab Hamid for inviting me to this elegant meeting, and I will start my lecture today by the last slide in the previous lecture that mentioned that heart failure stability is relative, and relative patient in heart failure is somewhat difficult. Worsening heart failure today, unlike other cardiovascular disease like MI or stroke, heart failure is a progressing disease experience a periods of instability, what's called like worsening heart failure. First of all, what is defined, or how can we define worsening heart failure? Worsening heart failure is defined as escalating symptoms and signs of heart failure needing intravenous diuretics and hospitalization. What about the prognosis of these events of worsening heart, uh, heart, uh, worsening heart failure? Worsening heart failure, according to the registry, the latest registry conducted over 11,000 patients, revealing that the regressing in the survival of patient and about 30% of patient will not be alive by the two years after an event of forcing heart failure. In addition, there is frequent uh, uh, of rehospitalization again after the first attack of forcing heart failure. Worsening heart failure and rehospitalization is a predictor of recurrent and subsequent hospitalization. Actually, what about the causes of worsening heart failure or instability of heart failure patients? I can categorize these factors into four main categories. The first one, patient non-compliant to guideline directed medical therapy, which is called negligent patients. The second cause, patient who is unable to tolerate guideline directed medical therapy, either because of hemodynamic instability, chronic kidney disease, or hypotension. The third cause, in, in these patients who are tolerant to guideline-directed medical therapy, yet there is increasing and poor control of the comorbid condition in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients. And the fourth category, when patients are controlled comorbid condition on guideline-directed medical therapy, but this is a natural history of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, continuing to impairment of bump failure of the heart. The first category, we should ask the patient when presented to us by worsening heart failure, are you compliant? Are you taking your medication? Most of patients are neglecting the diuretics, which is a major and predictor factor of worsening of heart failure. The second category of patient, patient unable to tolerate guideline directed medical therapy. And most of this patient is related to doctor inertia to prescribe the guideline directed medical therapy, especially in patients with chronic kidney disease and patients with hypotension. And eventually, the 
consensus of heart failure of the guidelines have approving that there is several category or several phenotypes of patient, like patient with high potential. How can I deal with this patient? Patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction coming with high potential. Will I stop S inhibitor, RNA, agl 2 inhibitors? And in this category of patients, especially in patient with high heart rates, can I apply beta blocker in this hemodynamically unstable patients? And the guidelines or the consistency approving that the use of SGL2 inhibitors, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, and EVA protein to control the heart rate to prevent worsening of the heart failure. This is an initial management of this critical patient. By the time the blood pressure will go by improving the cardiac output, and, we can, and, and so we can implement the guidelines, the other guidelines directed medical therapy. And second, not all the patients with, with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are intolerant to beta blocker. Some patients cannot tolerate. This is uh, one of the trials of beta blocker in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. About 5 to 10 percent of patients on metoprolol was withdrawn because of worsening heart failure. Some patients cannot tolerate even the moderate dose of beta blocker. We should de-escalate the dose of beta blocker. If the patient is still Worsening heart failure, we should stop beta blocker in this category of patient and replace it by evabradin. The second issue in patients who are intolerant to guideline directed medical therapy is a chronic kidney disease. And this is the latest consensus that published in the last March about patient with chronic kidney disease. In patient with chronic kidney disease, we can apply the guideline directed medical therapy, approving that at ejection fraction at the EGFR about less than 15, we can still apply beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. And with EGFR 15 to 30, we can apply beta blocker, SGL2 inhibitor, ACE inhibitor. And above 30 GFR, we can apply uh, RNA in this patient. And about, about the escalation in patient with chronic kidney disease, we can even escalate in this type of patient, approving that we can escalate up to increase in the creatinine less than 50 percent from the basal creatinine to apply the guideline directed medical therapy that guarantee against worsening of heart failure and instability of heart failure patients. The third category of patient is the beginning or presence of comorbid condition at common in patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And in the registry, comparing that patient that presented with worsening <coughs> heart failure versus patient without worsening heart failure, they found that there is significant increase of all comorbid condition like hypertension, chronic artery disease, ischemia, and anemia, COPD, myocardial infarction. So presence of comorbid condition is major predictor of worsening of heart failure. What about the chronic kidney disease? Again, all the guideline directed medical therapy, even in patients with normal kidney function, are a protective or a nephroprotective to these patients, like a GL2 inhibitor by afferent arterial vasoconstriction, reducing the glomerular filtration rate and glomerular sclerosis. The afferent, uh, the afferent vasodilatation by the ACE inhibitor, ARNI, are reducing the glomerular sclerosis and protecting the kidney, even the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So, Dr. Inertia, that experienced in patients with chronic kidney disease will know that all the guideline directed medical therapy have a nephroprotective effect preventing chronic kidney disease in patients and even in patients already with chronic kidney disease, they are maintaining the kidney function versus placebo in all heart failure trial with special attention to diuretic resistance and a major predictor of worsening heart failure. We should screen the patient if this patient have a diuretic resistance, in patients, especially in patients with chronic kidney disease, we should shift to another loop diuretic like torzamide. Torzamide has a bioavailability reaching up 100% over frosimide in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction presenting was, with worsening kidney function and diuretic resistance. Using the sequential nephron block, using the hydrochlorocyzide, metolazole, to induce aggressive diuresis in patients with diuretic resistance. Hypoalbuminemia, as we know, all the diuretic al are albumin binding. So hypoalbuminemia will reduce the bioavailability bio of all diuretics in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Special attention in patients with ischemic heart disease coming with frequent worsening of heart failure without any clinical appearance of ischemia, we should screen this patient, especially patient with 
high risk factors, even without symptoms of angina. So coronary CT angio is approved in the guidelines of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to screen this patient if this patient are ischemic as a cause of worsening of heart failure, even without the sim symptoms. Referring this patient, if approved to be chronic coronary artery disease to surgery as a stitch trial, approving that, that revascularization of patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction will reduce heart failure hospitalization as a result of worsening of heart failure. And another special attention to arrhythmia, especially supraventricular arrhythmia and the atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal subclinical atrial fibrillation may be a cause of worsening of heart failure. So we, we should screen this patient getting to into paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or not. Cardioversion is important to re restore the sinus rhythm and prevent, prevent the worsening of the heart failure and rate control is crucial in patient with heart failure with reduced dejection fraction. Patient with atrial fibrillation at a heart rate at 100 will not improve at the maximum directed medical therapy. Our target to reduce the heart rate to above 2 to 70 per minute. At the guidelines approving even castor ablation for atrial fibrillation in patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation when it be a cause of worsening of heart failure. Special attention and again to the ECG of the patient with tachycardia over 100. It may not all the tachycardia over 100 be a sinus tachycardia, especially in heart failure, coming with all types of arrhythmia at low rate, even 100. 10, maybe even trachealor tachycardia. Take care of the deceiving CG in patient. It may be atrial tachycardia and experienced as uh, uh, sinus tachycardia, AV and RT, and the atrial filatar. All these type of arrhythmia must be cardioverted or first screened, then cardioverted to restore the normal sinus rhythm to prevent worsening of the heart failure status. Even how to block another type of arrhythmia in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, most of physician will gush to reducing or implanting VVI or DDD. This will induce a mechanical desynchrony in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, with resulting in worsening of heart failure. Instead of replacing or inducing or implanting VVI or DDD, you should escalate to CRTB to prevent the desynchrony. Even the patient is not wide core as complex in his ECG to prevent the worsening induced by uh, mechanical desynchrony. And finally, have you screened the serum ferritin in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Serum ferritin is a predictor of worsening of heart failure. This data recently uh, released from the DABA HF trial post hoc analysis about the patient of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction experienced with uh, uh, serum ferritin less than 100. We, they found that about 40% of patients in the DABA HF trial experienced low serum ferritin level. About more than one third of the patient experienced low ferritin level. What about the low ferritin level or iron deficiency in heart failure, even in patient without anemia? It is a predictor of more worsening of heart failure hospitalization in the WHF trial. So uh, 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 we should screen for low or iron deficiency in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And finally, and the last category of patient that can maintain on guideline directed medical therapy without comorbid condition, but this is a natural history of heart failure, progression of the bump failure. This is a natural history of, uh, of heart failure. It's not stable. And as I mentioned before, the heart failure is not stable patient and the stability in heart failure is relative. Actually, patient with heart failure go in a period of remission and the exacerbation of worsening of heart failure with decline in the mortality and survival of this patient. And the guideline directed therapy, medical therapy blocking this vicious circle of heart failure that will be ending in this, either neurohormonal blockade or SGL2 inhibitors that approved that all of these guidelines will decline the worsening of heart failure and mortality. This is the effect of the applying of the guideline directed medical therapy to the maximum tolerated dose, improving the sharpness of the decline of survival of patient of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What's the question now? The Fantastic Four in heart failure will be the final station in heart failure journey. Are the other weapons to prevent or delay the worsening of heart failure? Actually, yes. 
This is the full pillar of heart failure, SGL2 inhibitor, beta blocker, RNA, SGL2 inhibitor. But there is other, some medication and intervention, especially in silver and fight black hydrazine and, and nitrates. Patient with disproportionate mitral regurgitation, severe mitral regurgitation with non-coopted leaflets. This patient will not tolerate in maximum tolerated medical therapy and edge to edge repair of the mitral clip is essential in this patient. Patient with white QRS complex, this patient is indicated for CRT. And finally, patient with recent decompensation will be get benefit from Versiquet and other uh, uh, guidelines directed medical therapy. Patient with sinus tachycardia, even with beta blocker, still will benefit from evabradine to delay or to decrease the worsening of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. As the final slide, don't forget and revise other medication that may worsen heart failure status like nalestroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, glitazones, brabamil, and other CCB. My home message here, worsening heart failure is not uncommon in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patient. Prognosis is too poor following worsening heart failure. Every effort should be exerted to prevent worsening heart failure Screen for the cause of worsening heart failure is essential to manage the problem. Patient education is essential for patient non-compliant to medication. Avoid doctor inertia in applying guideline directed medical therapy to the maximum tolerated dose to the maximum tolerated dose to prevent worsening of heart failure. Strict management for heart failure comorbid condition is essential to prevent worsening heart failure. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walid, for your comprehensive uh, talk about uh, worse causes. Uh, the main causes are all causes of worsening of heart failure. Uh, I would like to give a hint that other causes uh, that we can't uh, um, we ignore. Uh, some uh, uh, doctors uh, uh, have not the courage to increase the doses of the prescription doses drugs. Uh, they start, they give, uh, maybe they give all the drugs, but uh, the minimal doses. And they, they haven't the, cha the, the uh, challenge or the courage uh, to, to increase the proper dose to maximum tolerated dose for fear of complications that could happen outside the clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is another factor. The uh, second uh, cause uh, is uh, that uh, uh, the doctor should be uh, intelligent and should uh, uh, advise his patient uh, of re for regular follow-up of his condition, even if he's stable, if it's assumed to be stable, there should be a regular clinical follow-up regarding symptom-wise, symptom uh, uh, lab-wise, uh, imaging-wise, uh, to um, declare if there is any complication added without the other can need. Yes. Another, th the third one I would like to say uh, of the uh, causes of worsening of heart failure uh, could be socioeconomic factors uh, the patient cannot tolerate uh, the, uh, the prices of the drugs, uh, stops of some of them because he can tolerate the expense of the drugs. And this is, could be another non-declared uh, cause of the worsening yes. of his condition because he is not receiving the proper drugs, he cannot pay. I, I think the, the last issue is solved actually by the, the insurance this time and many times. Uh, there is uh, most of the guideline directed medical therapy, even the ARNI, yeah. are applied by the insurance. Uh, I think it is uh, your last, uh, I had the floor. Uh, yes. Any question? I have from question the floor? here, Dr. Samir. Uh, thank you. Can I add one more cause? Uh, there is uh, other many causes, but I concluded <laughs> some cause. The most important and prevalent cause. Depression. Yes. Can, uh, Debra yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Torali. I think um, maybe the etiology of heart failure itself is uh, an explanation of uh, worsening heart failure. And he, most of us observe that uh, patients with cardiomyopathy, for example, the prognosis or the occurrence of worsening is more than other causes. Do you think that worsening is related to the etiological factors for heart yes, failure? Yes, the, especially if the etiological factor is neglected or not diagnosed. So screening of the cause is important. As I have mentioned, in some patients of the worsening, if they, if they are high risk for Coronary artery disease, we should screen for coronary artery disease even with normal ECG, even without symptoms of ischemia. Many cases with worsening heart failure, I screened by CT angio and found that this is extensive coronary artery disease. Other types of patients with subacute myocarditis may be pre not presented by the acute, the typical picture of myocarditis, but we should screen for subacute myocarditis may be a cause of worsening of 
هارت فيلير باي سي ام ار ويل ريزولف ذيس ايشو دكتور وليد ايرون ديفيشنسي انيميا از ا كوز اوف ورسنينج هارت فيلير ايرون ديفيشنسي ايرون ديفيشنسي ايرون ديفيشنسي ايرون ديفيشنسي ايرون ديفيشنسي بس ايرون اوفرلود از ون اوف ذا كوزز يس او فيريستريكت انا كان نفسي الهيموكروماتوز الهيموكروماتوز اولسو اوف هارت سبيشال امبيشنت وذ سلاسيميا is iron overload can increase the hemochromatosis and restrictive, especially restrictive cardiomyopathy. Thank you very much for, Thank you. for the sake of the time. Uh, we introduced Professor Karim Saeed from Egypt about the right side heart failure. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Magdi and the organizing committee for this invitation. And in this presentation, I'm going to discuss a challenging profile of patients, those patients with right-sided heart failure. They are challenging patient for several reasons. The first one, they are vulnerable patients to adverse event, including mortality. And as we can see here, among a uh, wide spectrum of uh, causes for right ventricular dysfunction, severe right ventricular dysfunction, after a year, 40% of patients will be dead. And after five years, more than 60% of patients will be dead. And in patients with HEPREF, it is estimated that for every 10% reduction in right ventricular ejection fraction, there is corresponding about 20% relative increase in mortality. And the same is applied in patients with HFPEF. Right ventricular dysfunction can be detected in up to 40% in patients with HFPEF. And it is one of the strongest predictor for mortality among those individuals. And even in patients with HFPEF, when they are going to have uh, CRT, the presence of right ventricular dysfunction entails non-response and poor outcome. And when they are going to have LVAD, the mortality rate in patients with right ventricular dysfunction is doubled compared to those without right ventricular dysfunction. This profile, of course, begets the physician to prevent and to manage right ventricle in the context of heart failure. And as expected, what have they did is they used the medications for the left side to be used in the right side failure. And as you know, this was not successful. Why? Because actually the right ventricle and left ventricle are two different hearts. They have different imperiology, morphology, anatomy, physiology, and hemodynamics. Even at the cellular and subcellular level, they are completely different. And when the right ventricle fail, it have a different compensatory and the maladaptive mechanisms compared to the left ventricle. For example, let us see to the spectrum of etiology for patients with right-sided heart failure. First, let us discuss left-sided heart failure. In left-sided heart failure, the main mechanism is related to the myocardium itself, intrinsic myocardial disorder due to ischemia or toxic myocarditis, among others. However, look to the spectrum of etiology here in patients with right side heart failure. In about 50%, it is related to the left heart. And in 20%, it is related to the lung, hypoxic lung disease. In another 30%, it is related to the pulmonary circulation. Only in 8%, it is related to the myocardium itself of the right ventricle. So the problem is outside the right heart. It is related to difficult to manage other system that is difficult to sort out and to manage. This is a major problem. Another challenge in managing patients with right-sided heart failure is the presence of the constellation of what is called congestive syndrome. Increased right atrial pressure will lead to sparenchymic congestion, and this will lead to some maladaptive syndromes. At the kidney, we have the cardiorenal syndrome. The increased congestion in the abdomen and the increased intra-arterial abdominal pressure will lead to venous congestion 
and decrease the gradient between the afferent and efferent, and the reduction in the glomerular filtration rate and salt and water retention. And also we have a claimed reflex called the hepatorenal reflex that will lead to renal vasoconstriction and sodium retention. This will cause poor response to diuresis, intolerance, and worsening of the renal function. And it is difficult to be sure that this patient with inadequate diuresis is related to this congestive kidney. How to sort out? We can analyze the venous flow of the uh, renal veins. Normally, it has this continuous pattern. And when this pattern becomes discontinuous, either biphasic or monophasic, this indicates the presence of elevated uh, right atrial pressure and increased intra-abdominal pressure as well. And actually, we can measure the intra-abdominal pressure itself by inserting a urinary catheter, connecting it to a manometer, and a value more than five to seven millimeter mercury denote increased intra-abdominal pressure. What to do to increase diuresis? and maybe to do ultrafiltration, and if there is ascites, we can do therapeutic paracentesis. Another domain is the cardiointestinal syndrome. This will cause poor drug absorption. We know this with frosimide, oral frosimide. Malnutrition and cardiac cachexia, which is a predictor for mortality. Protein losing entropy, causing hypoalbuminemia and disruption of the blood intestinal barrier. So some endotoxin will escape from the gut, translocated into the blood, and this will cause immune response, inducing inflammation, and further depressing the right and the left myocardium. Also, we have the cardiohepatic syndrome. The liver in patients with heart failure can be injured by two mechanisms. The first one is the passive congestion, and this will lead to cholestasis and the increase in the alkaline phosphatase and GG3. The other mechanism is ischemic hepatitis due to low cardiac output. Usually it is related to the left side of the heart. However, this will not occur without a congested liver. So the right heart should be affected as well. And it has impact. First, the prognosis. Patients with elevated transaminase with acute decompensated heart failure has worse inpatient and in hospital and out hospital outcome up to uh, three years. While patients with alkaline, alkaline phosphatase elevations has worse outcome after the discharge from the hospital, not inside the hospital. Congestive hepatopathy also have some clinical implications. Those patients usually have some abdominal pain. Sometimes it is acute. And we cannot differentiate whether this is due to congestion or cholecystitis, peptic ulcer, or even ischemic colitis. Sometimes in patients with ascites due to congested liver, we can make differentiation whether this is related to the heart or primary liver pathology. The presence of jaundice is clue against a heart cardiac cause. The presence of varices is another clue. And when we analyze the acetic fluid in cardiac patients, we'll have high LDH, protein level more than 2.5 gram per deciliter, and high uh, RBCs count. And of course, impaired drug metabolism. This is a neglected domain in the field of heart failure, the impact of hepatic congestion on the drug metabolism. This is of importance in kidneys, but in the liver, we do not have much data. R remember that. In beta blockers used for heart failure, carvedilol and metoprolol both are metabolized in the liver. And some other related to the ACI and ARBs. Finally, and the major challenge is a therapeutic challenge. The major challenge is that we do not have any randomized controlled trial for patients with isolated right side heart failure. Only we have small single studies that showed some favorable response with beta blockers, RAS inhibitors, and hydralazine. However, these results are inconsistent when we consider the underlying etiology for right side heart failure and we may have adverse event. The main pillar is to reduce the afterload, to optimize the preload, and to increase or enhance the right ventricular contractility. In doing this, we should respect some peculiarities for the right ventricle. Let's start with 
the after load reduction. The right ventricle is created not to withstand the pressure, only to withstand volume. And in this curve, as you can see, the right ventricle, when faced by sudden increase in the after load, it fails immediately. This is a common finding in pharmacoembolism. While the left ventricle, when faced by the same load, it fails modestly and slowly. And this can be seen when we analyze the pressure volume loop of the right ventricle. There is no isovolumic contraction phase because the pulmonary circulation is wide and low pressure. And the end stall will occur early before the end of the stall. The, the highest pressure will occur very early. And afterward, despite the declining in the pressure in the right ventricle, the blood moves to the capacious pulmonary circulation. Once we have an increased afterload, this is ominous. And this intimate relation between the right ventricle and the pulmonary circulation make us to consider the concept that we should express the right ventricular function in the context of the afterload. And this created what is called the right ventricular pulmonary artery coupling. How to assess this? Invasively, we have some uh, complex uh, tools using the loop curves. However, simply, we can use this equation to divide the TAPSI over the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. This will express the coupling. And after load, when increased, we have a mismatch between the right ventricle and pulmonary circulation, and we will have a failed ventricle. So to reduce the after load in patients with left-sided heart failure, we will reduce the pulmonary wedge pressure using diuretics and the other GTMD medications. In patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, of course, we'll use pulmonary arterial hypertension-specific medications, sildenafil among others. What about to use these medications in patients with left-sided heart failure, to use sildenafil, for example? Of course, the guidelines are clear. We should not use these medications in patients with pure pre-capillary, post-capillary uh, pulmonary hypertension. However, it gives some room to use these medications in patients with combined pre- and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And this is based, by, based on some evidence that showed the use of sildenafil in patients with HFPF and the combined pre- and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension was associated with improved six-minute walk test, NT pro mp TAPSI, function class, and even rehospitalizations. The second is to optimize the preload on the right ventricle. How to do this? First, we should reconsider two physiological facts. The Frank Sterling mechanism in the right ventricle completely differ versus the left ventricle. As we can see, the uh, blue curve, it is a steep curve. For each increase in the end diastolic volume, there is small increment in the stroke volume. So it, the Frank Sterling mechanism is not this helpful in patients with the right side heart failure compared to the left ventricle with more uh, steep curve. The second uh, issue is related to the uh, function of the interventricular septum. Usually the septum, as you can see, is crescentic and showing some point to the right side. This is important for proper function of the right and left ventricle. When the right ventricle is overloaded, this septum will shift to the left, and this will impair the contractility of the right ventricle, and it will increase the wall stress of the left, the right ventricle, beget tricuspid regurgitation, and it will underfill the left ventricle with poor consequences. So the rule here is that in patients with right ventricular dysfunction with normal after root, which is a minority of cases, such as in patients with right ventricular infarction, will depend only on Frank Sterling mechanism by giving load without stretching the right ventricle and causing septal shift. On the other hand, which is common scenario, patients with right ventricular dysfunction with increased after load, here we have a balance between not to decrease the preload significantly and not to increase the preload. And here we should go to the hemodynamic invasive assessment aiming to a higher, high filling pressure between eight to 12 millimeter mercury in the majority of cases. Finally, to enhance contractility. As we mentioned, in the majority of cases, the, the right ventricle is normal. 
And once we remove the insult, the right ventricle will uh, be normal. We see this in pulmonary end arthrectomy after CTAF. So the issue is to restore the coupling between the right ventricle and the pulmonary circulation by using what is called ionodilator, such as dibutamine, merinone, and dilibosimendan in acute situation. And of course, we don't have any drug for chronic situation. And the experience with digoxin in patients with the right size heart failure is disappointing without any evidence for benefit and maybe for heart. So to conclude, a patient with the right size heart failure is a vulnerable high risk patient for mortality. And a challenge is that in the majority of cases, more than 90%, the problem is outside the right ventricle. The congestive syndromes represent diagnostic and management dilemma. The right ventricle is associated with complex, unique hemodynamic and pathophysiological mechanisms that deserve some understanding and follow-up and management. And still now, we do not have an evidence-based therapeutic for patients with isolated right side heart failure. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, Professor Karim. Uh, just, I want to ask you one question. You mentioned some medications which may help. It's not guided uh, guideline uh, medications, but you didn't mention the mineral receptor antagonist in these medications you mentioned. Why? Uh, mineral receptor antagonist, when used in the dosage of the left side, which is 25 to 50, will not have this impact on the right side. Usually you use a larger dose, which is not tested before. This is a point. The second point, till now, we do not have uh, a randomized controlled trial to test this agent, despite being uh, logic to be used. We do not have this evidence yeah. till uh, now. But, but as you know, this congestive uh, hepatomegaly, which, which is uh, uh, associated with the right side failure, uh, the mineral receptor antagonists are beneficial. In a large dose, 100, 150, 200, which is not the standard dose used in the GTMP trial, uh, Zarel and others. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Shukran, uh, Dr. Karim. Thank you very much. And uh, for the sake of time, we have to close this session. Thank you very much for the audience.